I thought you couldn't even play anything on Linux. A Linux gaming PC requires all of that crap and then another mountain of crap on top of it. That's what I've been playing on this whole time. It is not that easy. Are you telling me this entire time that I've been playing on something that isn't Windows? Can't you believe that this kid with that bed of hair does this kind of stuff as a hobby? That's just cute. For those who are just tuning in to my irritating corner, hi, I'm a song, your hyperfixating gamer, and I use Linux. And that's not for any one reason in particular. If you've heard of Linux at all, it's a good chance that came from Linus Tech Tips Linux Gaming Challenge, that thing where two normies tried to daily drive their own personal Linux installs, which wasn't without its problems. Did I manage to completely nuke my desktop environment? Uh -huh, yeah. And before I trash on them too hard, let me be the first to say that the Linux Gaming Challenge was a landmark achievement for both Linus and Linux in general. Jesus, Linus and Linux, like no one's ever gonna mix it too up. Linus Media Group is a big enough channel to have built their own media sharing platform and hire an entire fleet of staff under their name. Putting out an entire series on Linux in front of literal millions of potential tech savvy users is the biggest platform boost that Linux could possibly have ever asked for. And no matter what the conclusion was in the end, it is one hell of an endeavor that I have nothing but the utmost respect for. Now with my compliments out of the way, wait, is it legal to make fun of bigger YouTubers? I already have somewhat of a personal bias against Linus Sebastian. From the videos he makes bordering on clickbait on the best of days, to Linus the person who kind of comes across as a bit of a patronizing asshole. Ad blocking is the exact same thing as piracy. Literally the exact same thing. <sighs> no, no it isn't. Now, some of that is rooted in my own personal tastes, so take all of what I said about him with a grain of salt. But this isn't a Linus hate piece. Even if you do or don't agree with his style of content or personality, that's all it is, and it does not give anyone the right to attack someone else for something as simple as having an opinion. Quantum. Fuck you, I can do what I want. If you haven't arrived at an equivalent level, you have no seat at the table to start talking. So let's put all that aside for a moment. The series on Linux gaming brings up a lot of potentially interesting points. The different choices of Linux versions makes jumping into it mentally paralyzing for new users. Hardware peripheral support can be lacking in places if the manufacturer doesn't give enough of a shit about Linux. A lack of a centralized hub for reliable information can be frustrating. And sometimes, just speaking personally here, weird problems can just pop out of nowhere and resolve themselves without really knowing what the cause was. Cool. Why is the floor missing? Ah! I would be lying to say that the Linux experience was perfect, because it really isn't, by any means. If these were just their honest experiences with the thing, then props for not having a filter for their own personal thoughts. However, as someone who's been using Windows since XP and 7 for most of my life, went all the way through 10's lifespan, and has been dailying Linux for the better part of a year now, I'm not seeing these issues they were having. And some of the points made were either exaggerated. The NVENC new encoder doesn't show up as an option, which appears to be down to NVIDIA's poop-tastic drivers on Linux. Or flat out wrong to begin with. I had to apt get OBS. The, the message that comes up when you try to execute the command doesn't say, hey, you should probably be using Pac-Man, you dunce. It tries to install some kind of dependency for apt, then just quietly fails and prompts you to do the same thing again when you try to use it. Infinite loop, baby. I don't think so. Is this the year of the Linux desktop? For gamers, the answer is no. And the more niche your use case gets, you know, maybe you're super into modding. Dega. Here we go! I think you get the point by now. Then again, this might just me being cynical, but a part of me wanted to say the whole thing was somewhat of a foregone conclusion, because I remember when Linus made his apathy of Linux very apparent. So you can sudo it up, I know, but I don't care. That's completely irrelevant to the target audience for this product. But 
times have changed and we've evolved as a people. And then is surprised that his entire computer collapses. Are you kidding me? Yikes. And I want to be one of many others to throw their hat in the ring and set the record straight on what using Linux is really like. But what do I know? I'm just some schmuck on the internet talking about video games that no one other than me cares about. What kind of authority do I have if I don't even have my own web store? SCCstore.com Shut up! And I'm not expecting to convince anyone to change because of what I say, because that isn't the point of this, or even the point of Linux. I just want to make the point that Linux works better for my needs despite its setbacks, and the state of operating systems is going in a really dangerous direction if Windows 11 isn't raising enough red flags or blaring bullhorns as it is. But why stop using Windows? No one asks, but good question. As I alluded to earlier, Windows was my safe space for the better part of... 18 some odd years now. Windows is where I got my boots wet into PCs, like a lot of people my age probably are. Family desktops, laptops, at school and work, my own personal workhorse rig, you name it, Windows was, and still, relatively, is everywhere. It worked well for me, for the time anyways. But as I started to become more technically inclined, I was in on the loop when Windows 10 was in its public beta, and quickly caught wind of all the privacy troubles that Microsoft's newest operating system had. To call Windows 10 user data practices invasive would be the second biggest understatement of the century. Right up there with Mr. Muskie had an oopsie. Oh sure, it once started with only collecting diagnostic data. You can't not create a Microsoft account. It forces you to go that route as long as your PC is connected to the internet. Then they forced invasive update policies that couldn't by any means absolutely not be disabled for three straight years. Now on 7, I can choose to skip those updates, which I guess makes my system less secure. That's nice. But on 10, they got rid of that option. You either update or you go to hell. Of course, we all know installing Windows means turning off a bunch of telemetry features, okay? Going through a bunch of scripts. Next up is the choose your privacy settings, which I'm sure Microsoft will listen to and respect. Then the Microsoft story became a thing, and so user accounts started being internet tethered, and even the store itself has probably been the most user hostile experience I've ever seen since Uplay. There are simultaneously no options for Microsoft right now for 100% offline, non-invasive software to run on my PC. Then major updates slowly caused system bloat to the point that you'd be better off reinstalling the whole thing on a yearly basis. Then updates started deleting user files because Microsoft outright fired their QA department and decided that their paying user base be the beta testers. But basically Microsoft has replaced flesh and blood humans that were creating these UI automated test cases and unit tests that were running daily against these builds and everything by and large by us, the consumers now testing this software and sending them the information from our computers. Then Binbo's Edge not only became a shitty Chrome clone, but a shitty Chrome clone that you can't even uninstall without like going into PowerShell and figuring out their obtuses how syntax that hasn't been updated for at least a decade now. With the browser that will protect your privacy by forcefully installing its own software without my permission. And if you ever dared to tweak the system to your liking, then the entire system has a panic attack until you reinstall it. I'm not trying to hack my damn system. I just want to change the graphics and the interface. You think I'm trying to delete the kernel. Microsoft is no longer in the business of building operating systems. They are in the business of building data collecting pieces of software. That's all they are. And now Windows 11 wants you to connect your data to their data so hard that they won't even let you install the system without a camera. Starting from January 1st, 2023, next year by the way, all device types except desktop PCs are required to have forward-facing camera which meets the following requirements. I have absolutely no doubt Microsoft at some point might reword this to be like, enable to turn off. Microsoft, you charge $100 for a Windows 11 home license, yet on the backs of your users, you're still delivering advertisements and featured apps and pre-installing applications to their desktop without their permission. That doesn't seem like a paid application to me. And even then, Windows is somehow even worse and more inconsistent than Fallout 76 wishes it could be? Like, I'm in dark mode here. Why do my file or folder properties appear blindingly white? 
They're not a third-party app, they're provided by Microsoft, and they're part of the file manager which uses the dark mode. And they don't adapt. The control panel doesn't either. What the hell do Microsoft think they're do- They're assholes. I had problems with Windows 10. So many problems that the last year I used it was on a version called Ameliorated, a pirated Windows image with no update or app store functionality whatsoever, but also a lot of broken features that makes it only slightly less uncomfortable than listening to my own voice when editing this video. Even some essential things like the newer NVIDIA drivers don't work because of a lack of universal app package support. This was the only way to ensure that Windows 10 was as privacy friendly as possible, but it says a lot when even Ameliorated's wiki pages suggest against using Windows altogether if all you want is a stable operating system. And after living with it for a few months, plus the baggage of five years of living with Windows 10 in the same way that someone lives with a crack addicted roommate, I was done with it altogether. And just in time, too, as that was exactly the period in time when the Linux Gaming Challenge was becoming a thing. I remembered seeing it pop up on the WAN show when it was just sort of a joke. Luke, do you want to do a challenge with me? Oh, okay. And it kind of had me looking into the scene a little more in anticipation for that series. Now, in all honesty, I had used Linux before on several occasions, and on a lot of different devices. Almost all of my PCs, from laptops to desktops, to GPD wins have all went through the Linux ringer before, but never for more than about a month at a time. After that was always when I found some amount of issues that bothered me to no end that I ended up restoring back to Windows. In fairness, I also did give Hackintoshing a try just to give a bit of a perspective at how much of a loser ah. nerd I am. Those were back in around 2015 through 2017, and the state of Linux gaming back then was emulating Windows in a low-level virtual machine and trying to patch it over to the main display to give an impression of gaming on Linux. So, cheating. Nowadays, we have all these special toys that no one could have dreamed of back then. We got things like DXVK, VKD3D, Wine getting a lot better, and Valve pumping a lot of money into all of them so they can make Proton and basically bundle a Windows compatibility layer into the native Steam client. What was originally a list of maybe 10 or so compatible games at its launch, and the bundle of headaches for the unendorsed ones, eventually grew to about 90% of modern releases being compatible with little to no overhead, sometimes with better performance. Not just that, but the Steam Deck is finally achieving some kind of Linux standardization that the old guard of Steam machines completely flopped at doing. It was also the help of a couple of other YouTubers, or I guess would that be Tuxtubers? That inspired me to take the plunge and even make videos like this. Hi, Pav! So, how do you switch to Linux anyways? Oh, that's an easy one. Not even a concern. Don't. No, really. Linux is not a thing for everyone, and just because some chuckle fuck on the internet's telling you that you should switch operating systems doesn't necessarily mean that you should. The OS is what makes a computer go What's wrong with you? It runs all your apps and dictates a lot about how your day-to-day -day work is going to, well, work. So if you like Windows and you don't notice any of the problems that I've mentioned that made me personally switch, don't feel pressured to. But what if you do want to give the Penguin a try? Then. I still wouldn't say to switch, weren't you just listening to me early? Like any move, whether that be moving house or into a new job, you always have, or at least want, a transition period. In my case, the reason I failed my earlier attempts at using Linux is because I was switching operating systems sporadically. They were very spur of the moment decisions that I would soon regret after realizing that something I wanted or needed couldn't be done and I didn't think of any alternatives fast enough. So the first thing that anyone should do, and what I did personally, is simulate the Linux experience in Windows, basically growing your own Linux at home. Some of the conventionally mainstream programs either have no real Linux version or gives Wine a real tough time because of some of the boneheaded decisions that the software makers make, probably just to piss off anyone not on Windows. But there are a lot of alternatives out there that can supersede or at least provide similar functionality on all platforms, and not just Windows specifically. This is the real boon of open source software. Not only are they openly collaborative efforts, and more often than not are completely free to use, but they also have cross-platform compatibility, with Linux usually getting the most attention. 
What that means, though, in this part of the transitionary period, is that you can download and try out these apps if they suit your needs. Photoshop might not be available, but there's always GIMP and Krita. Microsoft Office can be replaced with Libre or OnlyOffice, and you can do all of this from the comfort of your Windows desktop while you still have it. You don't need to get used to them right away. They all have their differences and quirks, since they are still free projects doing their own thing, rather than directly copying Adobe's work and getting a big fat lawsuit for their efforts. And you're still ultimately testing the waters to see if you like them in the first place, since this will be the biggest cost to switching to a family of penguins that big companies view as a burden to support. It's just something we have to deal with for now, but it's not as bad as it might sound. In a lot of cases though, assuming your name doesn't have Adobe in it, the app is probably already available in Linux as it is, like the browser you're using. But try and look at the apps you use now and see if those alternatives work. Finish up whatever work you have going on now with those apps if you need to, so that once you're about to switch, you don't have that moment of, Shit, I really need that old project file right now. This would also just be a really good time to start making backups, or at least moving things to separate drives away from the one Windows is on. Trust me, it makes life a hell of a lot easier. If you have some games though, uh, hold that thought because I have some words about that. I would also mention stuff about hardware, but it really doesn't matter. So long as it's a desktop made within the last decade or so, you're in the clear as far as Linux support. Peripherals like gamepads and audio systems work out of the box in the majority of cases. Others like gaming mice and keyboards have some way of programming them in Linux. But if your brand isn't a Logitech, Razer, or QMMK, uh... Good luck! So, you've started moving your workflow to more Linux-friendly stuff and made sure it's all primed for the big moving day. And now, it's time for the big question. One that's on seemingly every Linux user-to-be's minds. What Linux distro should I use? This is the ask that most Linux users are going to have a war over whenever a Windows migrant comes into the picture. There's so much division on what people think is right for what they think is the average user that it's a reason fragmentation was literally the first thing Linus brings up in his Linux series. It's a lot of noise, and it's warranted. But in a way, the choice is actually part of the appeal of Linux. You can go in however many directions suit your taste, whether you're computer savvy or not. Which distro do you use then? Many. So long as it's one of the popular Linux spins, you'll be served about equally well on whatever you pick, no matter what the naysayers might have to say about it. Ubuntu, Mint, Pop, Fedora, whatever, they're all doing similar things, so pick the one you like the look of. For what it's worth, I used Mint as my starter distro, then quickly moved to Arch, believe it or not. It has a reputation and a meme, by the way, but Arch and its derivatives have always been the ones that just worked the best for me, and I couldn't really say why. It might have also been that I've gotten so used to hacking away at Windows trying to get it to shut, shut up, up that Arch's grassroots approach speaks to me on some level. Also, it just has the most thorough documentation, which you ironically might find yourself referring to for help even if you aren't using Arch at all. If you care to follow my lead, which if you are, then shame on you, I'm using Endeavor OS, the friendlier Arch Linux that Manjaro wishes it could be. Once you've found the one right for your calling or sexual preference, just download the disk image, flash it, reboot, and that's it. The actual install process varies slightly from whichever distro you went with, but they're all incredibly simple and almost never have any dependence on the internet at all. The only account you ever need to make is a local one that isn't linked to some identifiable Facebook profile or whatever. Right, and before I forget, if you have a reasonably sized system drive that you're installing to, you might want to separate your root and home partitions. One of the greatest things about Linux right off the bat is that you can part out your drive so that all your personal day to day data is physically in its own space. So if for whatever reason you need to reinstall Linux or even switch distros, you can just format only the system files while maintaining all your configurations and files that you care about. Everything in Linux app-wise is pretty well standardized, so that programs will just find the files out of magically if you plug in a pre-existing home partition. As someone who's had to reinstall Windows at least maybe seven times now in the past few years, it baffles me that Microsoft hasn't considered anything like this. You know how it is, whenever you have to restart the whole Windows song and dance number, it's always a day of dragging files off to external storage, copying and re-registering registry items, making sure the things in app data go in the right places, and all of that junk. No, none of that exists on Linux. 
At this point, I've forgotten that I'm not making a Linux tutorial, but it's just to give you an impression on how simple it actually is. A lot of things in Windows always felt like it was obscured behind a layer of Microsoft pompousness, with this better than thou attitude about basic things like error codes. I don't know your language. Most of the time, plugging it into Google will get you a Windows forum thread asking to turn the computer off or on again, or jump straight into reinstalling the whole thing. On Linux, while I may run into issues every now and again about a dependency or some other error, the program will always give extremely detailed information about the error itself that, with some basic deduction, allows me to piece together the cause and find a solution pretty quickly. And on Macs, if you ever have a problem, it's because you're holding it wrong or something. My basic workflow, if you can call it that, isn't really all that special. Mostly I'm gaming, web surfing, discord chatting, emulating, eating, sleeping, work depressioning, you know, the millennial special. So in my case, a lot of the things I wanted to do on Linux could already be done with very little transition needed. Probably the biggest one, well, actually it's a few things, but the main one I got a bit stumped on for a while was art and graphics work. See, the program I used to main for the long time was something called paint.net. For the extremely minimal cases I had for it back on Windows, it did the job well enough, but there really wasn't an exact alternative to it on Linux. There's Pinta, sure, but it's super lacking and doesn't really seem all that supported anyways. So I essentially had to graduate to full-on professional-grade software to be comfortable. Krit is my main now, but for a while I was training on GIMP. Though, I just couldn't get used to the interface very much. It always felt like it was going over my head a bit. A couple of days later was when I moved to Krita, and since then I haven't really looked back. I make great use of it for shopping pics and creating these terrible thumbnails of mine. I can't possibly recommend it enough. However, if I wanted to make these crappy videos here about my video game hyperfixations, I need to be able to record them. Thankfully, there's a couple of choices on Linux available. The most famous one probably being OBS Studio. Yes, the streaming software, for whatever reason, has also tangentially become somewhat of the de facto standard for recording locally. I will admit that it does have a lot of options to tune the quality of the output. Too many options for my liking, especially if all I'm doing is recording Tales of Zestiria footage and nothing else. For some reason, I could just never get on with OBS as a recorder. It just was never my thing for that, even though literally everyone else seems to rely on it. Nearly any Linux screencast footage you see on YouTube, I guarantee you it has the OBS mark of shame somewhere in the status tray. What I was looking for was something more along the lines of NVIDIA Shadowplay. It's a really neat piece of kit that's integrated into NVIDIA's Windows drivers, and offers near source levels of footage with no noticeable overhead or footprint, and could be toggled with either normal screen recording or an adjustable replay buffer with a simple hotkey. It was easily the biggest reason I've been using NVIDIA cards for so long, and when I first came onto Linux, the closest lighter weight alternative was... Uh, simple screen recorder, which, let the record show, was anything but simple. The interface was kludgy as heck, and the output relied entirely on CPU encoding, which would be fine for media transcode if I'm not doing anything else, but not in the middle of the game that's actually using those cores. But now, and I'm letting you in on some trade secrets here, because I found what's probably easily the best hole-in-the-wall Chinese shop program you'll ever find in Linux. GPU Screen Recorder. It's literally what the name says. A screen recorder using the GPU in the exact same way that NVIDIA Share works, with the same no overhead recording functionality. Now, it ain't easy to find outside of Arch, and you'll need to use Apache NVIDIA driver to use it to its fullest, but I'm telling you right now, this video is mostly an unpaid sponsorship for this program. I freaking love it. And it baffles me that almost no one else seems to talk about it except for me, of all people. The quality is excellent, the program is actually simple, it lets me record both system audio and microphone on separate tracks, allows capturing either individual windows or screens, or even the entire spanning width of combined displays. That's how Linux actually looks, folks. It does it all, and features the same configurable replay buffer as Share alongside traditional on and off screen recording. If you have an NVIDIA GPU and plan to do content creation, first off, don't, you're crazy and I don't recommend it. But also. Please use GPU Screen Recorder and send the developer my kudos for all the work he's put into it. On a side note, one of the running themes to the point of almost being a hate gag between Linux tubers 
is that people really hate NVIDIA for some reason. Do you have an NVIDIA GPU in your Linux box? Well, firstly, I offer my condolences. Nobody should be forced to live through that. I'm sorry. The fuck? This just makes it sound like someone died. Uh, I have to talk about this now. <laughs> yes, yes, I know the technical reasons behind it. But the extent that some people in the community will go to shame NVIDIA users to the point of discrimination is honestly kind of despicable. Yes, technically AMD have open source options, but that really isn't the full story. While AMD allows support for it in the open driver, that really only covers the bare essentials of gaming support and just gaming alone. As soon as you move anywhere beyond that, like compute functions for example, which is a very common use case in things like video editing, you need to play GPU driver hopscotch to budge programs to run on AMD's proprietary driver stack, alongside the free one. It also comes down to, for me anyways, NVIDIA's NVENC having no real equal in real-time video encoding, and GPU screen recorder only works on green team cards. It is true that NVIDIA in particular have been dicks in the past, with a history of some anti-competitive practices and some really baffling design trends in recent years. There's a reason you'll see this clipped in nearly any NVIDIA on Linux discussion. So, NVIDIA, you. <laughs> but first off, Literally all of the big three are dicks and have their fair share of anti-consumer practices. Secondly, Team Green has since opened up their driver for Linux to eventually be available inside the kernel rather than remain exclusively a black box driver. Sure, it's incomplete in some areas and only works on RTX, but they've been quite forthcoming about making it the de facto standard with time. And thirdly, and this is the most important to me, as a customer who just uses the video card, I've never once had an issue in Linux, whether it be in gaming or otherwise, where the root cause of the issue turned out to be the NVIDIA driver. The one exception to this was one driver update that had issues with DisplayPort and HDMI displays, but these kind of bugs are nothing exclusive to either the Penguin or Green Eggs and fans. And it was resolved in about a week on a rolling release distro, aka the kind of distro where problems are expected to happen more often than their fixed version counterparts. Having one driver flub that I could easily roll back in the nine months I've used this setup with otherwise no issue on Arch Linux is pretty damn miraculous, wouldn't you say? That aside, editing videos was the last hurdle I would have to overcome if I wanted to display my greasy face on the tubes from Linux. My non-linear editor past has jumped from all manners of programs, starting with a bit of Vegas, to Final Cut Pro, to the open source options, and more. My go-to at the time of using Windows was HitFilm Express, which is a free editor with a one-time paid version for essentially just premium effects. But while it has Windows and Mac releases, unfortunately there is no Linux support in sight, and its compatibility with Wine leaves a lot to be desired. Adobe has also infamously made it clear that they see no desire to ever support Linux, and I would much rather catch autism than use anything from the company that wouldn't pay the license for colors, yet expect its consumer base to pony up actual thousands of dollars for their bug-ridden internet tethered at gas suite. I'm sorry, that's an insult to both of those things. There are certainly open source editors available, but they range from the gamut of unintuitive, unstable, promising but not ready yet, or Caden Live. The latter of which probably has the most potential to be good, but is still lacking in major areas like general polish, effects, and complete lack of graphics acceleration. Pretty important in something that's made to create graphical content. So on Linux, that essentially leaves the only option of DaVinci Resolve, an editor that I once demoed a long time ago for maybe a total of five minutes before switching to headphone. And yet, here I was running right back to Lord DaVinci like the coward I am. Resolve is easily the most full-featured editor. Not just on Linux, but in general. It takes a lot of getting used to, as would any NLE, let's be honest, but Resolve even more so. But once you get the handle of things like the embedded Fusion Node Graph Editor, Resolve is almost as addictive as crack. And again, it's a one-time purchase for enhanced prefab effects, meaning even less money going into Adobe's pockets. But to be honest, I've just been using the free version without much of an issue. Well, except for one thing, which, ironically enough, Resolve Studio wouldn't fix entirely. 
For whatever reason, Black Magic, either in their infinite wisdom or laziness to conform to licensing, has arbitrarily limited the input formats you can use for video projects, specifically on Linux platforms. Advanced MPEG support is a paid tier only thing, but then there's AAC audio support that's completely stripped out of the Linux builds entirely. You know, AAC as in the audio format every video ever uses. So unfortunately, aside from having to set aside actual hundreds of gigabytes of space, I also had to re-encode them with uncompressed audio. That was easily the biggest pain in the ass of getting this to work, since it would have been perfect otherwise. Aside from that little qualm that I have, I've been able to do all of my work in Linux without any real regret whatsoever. And yes, that also includes... This was kind of a shock to me at first, but gaming on Linux has been actually genuinely doable for the past two years or so. Ever since Valve spearheaded their Linux initiative by pumping developers and money not going to Half-Life 3 into their fancy Proton project, gaming has evolved so rapidly that I can barely even count on one hand the number of games in my personal library that don't work. This includes both Steam and non-Steam games, by the way. The long and short of it is, the only games that won't work are online-enabled games with intrusive anti-cheat measures that hampers the game experience anyways, and the user's privacy. Or are made by Bungie. In which case, f*** you, you don't get to play Destiny 2, I guess. Which, inadvertently, might be one of Linux's biggest selling points. You could probably gather from my taste in games, and my tone of voice there, that I really wasn't affected all that much by this. Not to say I'm against big AAA games, though that certainly wouldn't be an overstatement to suggest. Wait a second, wasn't I just talking about this? You can finish it at any time. You know, once the Fortnite train has run its course, we could really use more games like this again. Damn! It's just that I've stopped caring about big multiplayer games when they all basically became skins on either Fortnite Battle Royale, Counter-Strike hyper-competitive shooters that I don't have the mental gymnastics for, or the anime game that... What's the point of you being hiding at anymore? We all know it's Bubsy 3D. Point is, big games kinda suck, so if they don't work day one on Linux, then that's not my issue. But it might be for you. For what it's worth, it's not that these games couldn't be made to work on Linux at all, because it's not necessarily even a technical limitation of it. Sega actually recently went out of their way to make the global release of Fantasy Star Online 2 friendlier with Linux, and that's easily one of the biggest, if not the biggest MMOs in Japan. So if that can be made to work perfectly on Linux, then what that says to me is that it's negligence on the developer's behalf, which says a lot more about the game and what it's worth to me if the people implementing actual rootkit anti-cheats don't value me as a consumer as much as Sega, the creators of Sonic forces does. Speaking of hedgehogs, mods. Yes, despite what Linus alluded to, mods are totally kosher on Linux. In a lot of cases, it isn't even all that much harder than it is on Windows. Steam Tinker Launch is a banging little app that essentially automates the process of setting up games for modding. Installing the Vortex Mod Manager is only a few clicks away, and BAM! You can mod all the fallouts and Skyrims you want with no issue. Hedge Mod Manager works too for the Sonics, from generations even through frontiers. You can have all your Monster Hunter mods, Risk of Rain, Payday 2, all of the Tails fixes and near engine hacks you want. Many of them basically work out of the box. The funny thing is, I was originally going to talk about how some mod tools and launchers were at least transparent about their unwillingness to support Linux, but that's changed drastically within just these few months. Now, almost all of them either support it outright or are beginning to migrate to a more open platform that works better under it, usually specifically with the purpose of supporting Linux better. But there is a small catch to this. And it's only partially Linux's fault. Remember what I mentioned, maybe not keeping your game library backed up when transferring to Linux? Really, this mostly affects modding games, but even Valve recommends against using Windows as an TFS file system if you're running Windows games on Steam for Linux. Why is that? Well, aside from NTFS dating back to the XP era, Linux's support for it is a bit lacking purely because of its proprietary and lockdown nature. You can mount NTFS drives just fine, but it's really only for migrating data to and from it, and I would not recommend daily driving it on Linux by any means, because you won't get the same performance that you could get by using literally 
any modern Linux file system instead. The biggest issue though, actually came up when I was using Vortex for the first time on Linux. Whenever I deployed mods, there was a 1 in 100th chance that the progress bar just stops. Yeah, for whatever reason, mod managers doing fast file operations and overwrites like Vortex actually partially corrupts NTFS partitions. And Linux has no way of repairing these specifically. The solution? Ah! Booting Windows 10 and sitting through disk repair for 10 minutes. Every. Single. Time. Thankfully, I had the sense to eventually pull my games library off of Windows dependence and went all in on Linux native file systems. And I've literally never had disk corruption issues since. It's rock solid. If you're technically inclined to be modding games often on Linux, I'd suggest making an ext4 partition with casefold support and marking your games directory with it. Linux normally is case sensitive. Two files named the same with differences in uppercase or lowercase are considered nice different part. files. Case folding then makes the file system mimic Windows's case insensitivity, where those same differences don't matter and both would be considered the same mm -hmm. file. Mods especially love to mix casings when they share common data paths or overwrite a common file. And this actually was a cause of some crashes when running modded Skyrim. There would be two models folders because of the case differences, both with different contents inside. This causes Wine to throw a hissy fit and crash if there are conflicts like this. In all honesty, I have no clue why this obscure setting isn't standard yet, but that's just another area that Linux can improve on. Most of this part mainly focused on Steam, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily limited to only games on that platform. You can always try and run non-Steam games inside of Steam, but that would be ignoring all of the plug-and-play benefits of Proton and dumbing it down to the glorified wine that it is. So, for games outside of Steam, that's where apps like Heroic and Lutris come into play. They're both very similar programs that are used to help get Windows things running as seamlessly and painlessly as possible. The former's focused on Epic and GOG, and the latter for pretty much everything else. I won't go into that much detail because there's already plenty of other videos that go more in depth on the topic that you could be watching. But instead, you're watching me. That said, I'll just say in general that most games usually work so long as you use the latest version of Wine, DXVK, and VKD3D available. Ironically enough, most of the edge cases I found were games that are too old to use modern video codecs. Namely, the original PC release of Devil May Cry 3 Special and the 2004 Sonic Adventure DX use a very old MPEG codec that doesn't play nice with newer Wine releases, for whatever reason. SADX just needs an older version of Wine to bypass this, but DMC3's pre-rendered demos doesn't want to play ball at all. But like the rest, their mods all still work though. Other than that though, Origin, Uplay, ActaShit.net all pretty much works with only the rare downtime that tends to get addressed pretty quickly anyways. Unless your name is 2K, whose craptastic new launcher actually broke the Bioshock games on both Epic and Steam. Quality of life my ass. You mean quality of money! In that case, the solution is just to change the target executable to the game's own, and now you can share your grievances alongside Windows players. It's always the biggest corporations making the worst crap that brings people together, isn't it? Though I wanted to say a word about games in general on Linux. I've been ranting incessantly about Proton and Wine specifically, and some Hawkeye viewers might know where I'm going with this. What about the native ports song? That's the real gaming on Linux! There are some native ports that are actually really good, and I would recommend overusing the Windows versions. Unreal and UT just got some attention recently, and they're really good for getting the Wine dependence out of the picture. Serious Sam Fusion has a pretty solid native port utilizing Vulkan. Some games like N++ only work with the native version, so it makes sense to use that. And then there's... Oh, that only makes four. Yeah, I've only run into four native ports that I'd consider good, and only one of those is actually commercial. The Unreal Engine 1 stuff is all fan-made. For every other game that I have that offer native versions, I just ignore them entirely and force those games to use the Windows versions over Wine instead. Many of the ports that weren't made in the last few years, which unfortunately is most of the ones that are available on Linux, don't perform well or aren't very compatible with mods. Some like Binding of Isaac and Borderlands 2 are actually outdated and missing content because the ports simply couldn't keep up with the originals. And in many cases, the versions running through Wine and DXVK or such actually perform better or have more graphical features. 
It's honestly amazing how far Linux gaming has come that we've gotten to the point of rendering native ports obsolete that were just a couple of years ago an absolute necessity in even having them playable at all. <laughs> all of this doesn't even cover emulators, and those work exactly as they should on Windows. Because they're all naturally hobbyist projects, and more often than not open source anyways, they'll almost always have a reliable Linux port available that just works. RetroArch, Dolphin, RPCS3, Citra, Yuzu, Simu, everyone's here. The only outliers really are those emulators for the Xbox family, which are still works in progress anyways. Unfortunately, on the other hand, as someone who likes my light gun shooters, I had to give up on Techno Parrot. At least light guns work with other things like RetroArch pretty much out of the box. Maybe I'll get to talk more about gun games some other time. I even made a small script that launches a front end every time I plug this in and exits when it's removed. That brings up a good point though. Isn't Linux for nerds? Well, it is, but it's not. Linux is pretty well known for its terminal, and depending on who you ask, is either praised as better than any GUI available, or decries it as a crutch for bad user experience. As a lot of things are, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Yes, Linux has a command line that's ever-present, and diehards will remind you at every opportunity whether you like it or not. My stance on this is that a great command line program can easily coexist with an equally great graphical front end or alternative. If someone wills it into existing, any option should always be there for the less technically inclined. I daily drive Linux. I literally don't even have a trace of Windows on this computer at all. And even I say that things like drive management shouldn't be gated behind a frankly obtuse FS tab. Package managers should have a graphical interface to at least easily search for programs. And if people want to use their graphical file manager to mess with their system, then let them. People waggling their fingers at others for having a preference on how they want to use your system is no better in my mind than Windows's cryptic errors. They shouldn't feel pressured to using a command line just because of an absence of any graphical interface that eases them into it. But then, on the opposite end of that token, I love the command line for what it's best at. Automation. The fact I can update my system by just typing YAY in a pop-up terminal is a great achievement. So is being able to make a service that automatically opens things or kills them depending on what devices are plugged in. It's not even that I use it often, but the few times I do open up a terminal, I'm happy that it's as useful as it is. And in a weird way, it is kind of fun sometimes. But then that leads into something else. The perspective that Linux is harder to use than Windows. I don't agree with that. Because despite what some people might say, Linux isn't Windows. And it isn't meant to be that either. It's harder to use in a lot of the ways that using a Mac is harder for a Windows user, and even the big Linus can attest to that. What Linux is to me, in comparison to Windows, is that Linux gives you, the user, the power to use your machine as you please. But like Alfred says, with big power comes big responsibility. You have the freedom to use your computer, but that also means the responsibility of keeping that computer in good shape is in your hands and not the manufacturers. Ergo, it's not going to coddle you into updating like Microsoft would force you to, but it also has no problem in giving you a gun to shoot yourself in the foot either. Linux is free in that way, for better and for worse, and really, it's up to you, the user, of what you make of that choice. Then again, anyone willingly using PC should expect some amount of maintenance going into it. Going from Windows to Linux comparatively has a lot of the same cost as going from a console to a PC. And that's up to the individual if they're willing to accept that or not. And no one's a shitter person for having their own thoughts. But at least with Linux, you're not even necessarily alone in that thinking. It's a community-driven endeavor, so there are a lot of people like you who are willing to help. Outside of Canonical with Ubuntu, or Red Hat with... Red Hat? There are no big companies driving one showboat here. Instead, it's all of these fleets of little distributions, packagers, and app makers that are coming together to make one bigger collective that helps to support each other. But it only takes one bad egg in any one of these fleets to drag down the rest of them. To get topical for a sec, it's kind of like how you have some man who gets tickled often that allegedly reviews TVs, proclaiming how he's part of the so-called PC master race just because he spent a lot of money that as a real PC gamer who actually invests 
thousands upon thousands of dollars in PC. No, Quantum, that doesn't mean anything, nor change the fact that you've threatened 10 too many people on YouTube alone. But also, there is no master race of anything here. If anything, that phrase is a logical fallacy. Calling yourself the master race of anything implies that you're nothing without that title. And that's derogatory to both yourself and the thing that you're pledging allegiance to. That also means Linux doesn't automatically grant you permission to be toxic towards newer users or your competition either. I've run into that myself, and I think I can safely speak for a lot of people that it doesn't help our case any by acting so righteously in your beliefs. Sad that I have to teach you manners over the internet rather than your mother doing that I'll explain why this attitude pisses me off in Russian there is a saying la 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 spit in your soul or shit in your soul which is referring to people trying to I almost feel sorry for it show them respect for their interest and be understanding when they have problems because we've all been there before basically it all comes down to hey don't be a dick Thankfully, the dicks in the audience seem to be pretty well in the minority. How do I know this? Well, you remember that anecdote that Luke Laffey gave? The one about the alleged game developer who was flooded by support tickets from its Linux user base, despite them making only a single digit percentage of the revenue? Turns out, that particular game was already in a bug-riddled state for a long time across the board. It would basically be like if you were to base the performance of Linux gaming exclusively off of Mighty No. 9. I thought that it would be fair to show that it goes both ways. The dev behind Delta V argues that despite making less money off of Linux sales in total, the Linux user base actually helped bring their game to a better state for all affected platforms. Why? Well, for one, out of the 400 issues, only three were specific to Linux. And also because the free software crowd, on average, has much more insightful and detailed bug reporting and testing, and just wanted to see their project be the best that it can be. And that, I think, is the power of a community in action. I can only hope that more developers in the future follow this example rather than Bungie's. Windows shouldn't be a de facto monopoly for PC enthusiasts when it comes to gaming and productivity. Instead, make the apps and games people use open to everyone, regardless of platform. It would not only make daily driving Linux that much easier for the layman, it also evens the playing field. That way, we can let the users decide what they want to use based on the product itself, and not the trinkets that happen to be attached to it. In the end, I just wanted to give my own views on Linux, and how that shouldn't be a political statement. But kinda ended up turning into one towards the end. Sorry, I couldn't help myself but to wax poetic about something like this because I felt really impassioned about it, and that's all I can really say about it. I haven't even had the chance to touch on things like the different desktop environments or the surprising amount of hardware that's supported out of the box, because this script's getting way too long for what I originally intended this to be. A lot of this video was inspired by Pav, who also makes great Linux content, and I'd also like to say kudos to the other creators whom I source clips from. They're all well worth your time, more than I could ever dream of being. Most of this is just my own personal digressions though, so feel free to leave some feedback in the down below. I think you get the gist by now. With that, remember to stay kind, be courteous, show some love to the people around you, and thanks for watching. <laughs>